Hello and welcome to the Ask Weldon Show, episode 108. I am back in Finland for the week and... Hmm, what's new? Went to negative 14, tons of snow. Then I went to 3 degrees, everything melted and it rained. Just overnight, you know, so nobody could enjoy it when it was warm. But then we walk out in the morning and it's slushy and drops below freezing and now I live on an ice sheet island. Like, the entire central part of the country is just a gigantic ice sheet. So that happened, and uh, my wife is just now wearing around boots that have steel studs in the bottom, just like a tire, Then just don't even put on shoes, just put on steel studded boots. It's the only way to walk around here anywhere. And uh, we celebrated American Thanksgiving, which was delicious and amazing. That was a, uh, I guess actually that was before I went back to Berlin and then came back. Yeah, because I've only been back like one day or two, so wow, that happened a while ago. Okay, fast forward. Tomorrow is Finnish Independence Day. They call it Itzenaisus Baiva, and they don't blow anything up. They don't explode fireworks everywhere like we do. They just kind of watch TV for five hours, and it's the President's Ball. So red carpet event, and they just talk about um, everybody's dress, and who got invited and who didn't. It's like the who's who of Finland, 2016. So if you got invited, you've made it. And if you didn't get invited, keep trying. I remember the first year that the guys at Rovio got invited, like the chick went in a massive red uh, Angry Bird dress. It was awesome. People talked about it the entire year. It was just the best. That was about the most notable thing that's happened in the last five years in Finland, I think. I don't know, that's probably insulting to Finns because they remember lots of other notable things. But for me, it was the Angry Birds dress at the President's Ball on East Nice Five that like, will forever be branded in my memory. Let's jump into it. And by the way, questions are over there. So when I look over there to read, I apologize to everybody who's watching me here in the in the video. So question number one from I'm a Mitten. You're back! Congratulations. I didn't know Mittens could type so fast. I thought you had to like, you know, smash a bunch of letters and then selectively press delete until you finally got the word that you wanted to spell. How are pregame rituals useful? Quirks and superstitions aside, conquering my foes in my mind's eye should have some merit, right? Interesting question. Pregame rituals, also known as pre-performance routines in the research lingo, are well-researched, so there have been a number of studies. Studies that were descriptive, there have been experimental studies in the lab, there have been experimental studies in the realm, I guess you would say, and the grand takeaway of that research kind of in aggregate is that they work when they th when you think they work and they don't work when you don't think that they work. So pregame rituals are as effective as your belief in them. Meaning that what really happens when you do a pregame ritual is you calm yourself down and you focus yourself. I don't mean calm yourself down energy-wise, I mean you calm your mind and you focus yourself. You take the worries away, you take the thought out of the process and you become automatic. And that happens if you believe in the pregame ritual and you do it and it like has its effect on you. But if you don't believe in it or if something violates that belief in it, as in you start playing and things are going wrong and you're thinking, oh, but what I'm wearing my lucky underwear, what's going on? Then it stops, ha it stops working, it stops helping. What we know is that there's a skill that you can actually choose to kind of quiet your mind and have a, have a sort of focus, an automatic focus on performance. Therefore, you should be able to do it without the ritual, right? And certainly enough, it turns out that this is a skill that you can train, which is that of mindfulness, which is to pull yourself away from the distractions of whatever is like tugging at your attention, tugging at your focus. You can think of attention as like a 100% like pie, right? And when you have worries, distractions, things that have nothing to do with the execution of your game, or the execution of your automatic game, then it's, it's chipping away at that pie, so you're at 98%. Now all of a sudden things that are only possible for you when you're 100% focused are impossible, which means you will mess them up. So that's why the ability to be full focused all in on what you're doing is so crucial because when you're operating at the peak of performance and you can only pull this off at the peak of your performance, when you take away that edge, you add in you know 2%, 3%, 5% distraction, that's the game right there. That's the function of pre-performance routines and superstitions. That's why they work on humans. That's the extent of the, which they work on humans. They usually kind of like function most usefully in people who are, you know, gonna cruise with them or as a reset switch for people that, that it kind of works with or as a way to kind of incorporate and make your whole team 
more on the same page. So for example, when I was at TSM, we were doing pre-performance rituals that were both well-constructed on my end and then individualistic. So what we did was we essentially created a, a very rigid structure for how and when and why we would go to the LCS in terms of what we would do when we got there, how we would travel when we got there, how we would talk when we got there, what we did you know, every single day when we went to makeup, when we went to our match, um, that we were trying to show up early just to make sure that everything that could be controlled was controlled. And so that helped the rhythm of the competitive situation and helped people find their equilibrium. And then we did a, a little bit of discovery over what it is that each person requires in, as an individual to get up into a individual zone of optimal functioning. Because everybody's different. Some people need to be angry, some people need to be calm, some people need to be fired up, some people need to be focused. Some people want to be like, not worried about anything, don't think about it. Some people want to go through all of their thoughts and you know worries, get them all out of the way. So we had time and space for that. We did a little explorative, explorative activity early on the split. We mapped out everybody's pre-performance zone and more importantly, their performance zone. And then we, we looked at the preconditions for that. Do you need to be social? Do you need to have your headphones on? Do you need to be with the group and, and joking around? Do you need to be off in a corner? Do you need music or not? And we, we put those together. And so everybody had their kind of their own thing that they tackled, but we combined that with the team unit. So if you're on your own and you're not in a competitive setting, meaning it's not a live competition, then essentially you're looking at kind of the Korean style things where, you know, they measure their keyboard out in StarCraft, Brood War, and you know, everything's placed right and they have to have everything at the right angle and all that sort of stuff. I recommend mostly if you're not live to avoid anything like that. And you should train yourself to be robust without those kind of circumstances. So you should train yourself to be able to compete when your mouse is in the wrong position, when your keyboard's in the wrong position, when your chair's in the wrong position, when you're wearing the wrong clothes. Because what that does is you're training the ability, even though you're not doing mindfulness, like you're not doing a mindfulness meditation or a mindfulness training, what you're doing is the same exact thing. You're training that ability to have a disturbance or, or something that's annoying, push through it and bring your focus to where it should be. And you can think of that as a muscle in your brain that you, you can push to the extreme. And uh, that's, that's a, an essential skill for a high competitor. Okay, the second question today from Vitor Aurora. That's kind of disturbing. That's actually my World of Warcraft name. Hmm. For my second World of Warcraft character. And also my, uh, it was my login for my EU Northeast account. Now it's not anymore. No, no, no. Was it even my login or just my account name? I'm not even sure now. No, it wasn't my login. It was my it was my account name. You know, my 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 ladder name. Back in the day, I'm struggling to concentrate for long hours when I'm studying. Help! Which food items help to improve your concentration, if any? Yeah, caffeine, best. Combined with L-theanine, two together. Don't take L-theanine by itself. It's a depressant. It will put you to sleep. It's a downer. Stimulants. So clearly, those help your concentration. And then there are a lot of anecdotal and like small time studies on various micronutrients. So things like radelia and, you know, various roots and barks and herbs and all of this kind of stuff. And unfortunately, I cannot tell you that research has conclusively said that concentration is increased by, by any of these, but that doesn't mean it doesn't, that doesn't mean it doesn't happen, that it's not increased. What that means is essentially in the scientific community, there's not a consensus about it. So there are some studies that show that it does. There's some studies that show that these things don't, depending on the chemical. There are some double blind placebo controlled studies that kind of do, there's some that don't. And so until there's an aggregate of evidence and data that can conclusively point to one side of the spectrum or the other, even a little bit, and we know the significance. So there's a lot of stuff to consider when you're looking at a chemical. Mostly, well, the biggest thing is dosage amount. So for the effect, so let's say your concentration increases by seven. What does that mean? You know, first we have to measure like how much concentration increases. So first you need to make a test for concentration, and then it has to be something that's not trainable, right? So you have to, it has to be a test that is, that is something that you don't get automatically better at over time, so that. As the concentration increases, we know it's the drug that's doing it and not just you doing the thing again over and over again, right? So 
It's really hard to test, first of all, concentration. You can test alertness, things like reaction speed. Concentration, a little more difficult. You know, you can measure like the distance. I mean, how do you measure somebody's self-reported focus on a, on a specific idea or, or thought? Your concentration test is the, is the first issue. And then second one is what is the dosage response? So at what point does the dosage of a chemical cause a certain response? And what is the optimal amount? So for example, do you need, what if we tested 10 milligrams of caffeine? Well, we would see that there, maybe that we would see there was no change in concentration or in focus or in concentration. But if we tested, you know, 200, depending on the test, we might also see no change in concentration because it makes you so scatterbrained. So all of a sudden, you have two tests that show that this chemical caffeine has zero, you know, has a negative effect on concentration and no effect on concentration at best. All of these studies need to be replicated at different dosages to kind of figure out what's going on. The mechanisms then can be start to be understood. Then you have to figure out the optimal dosage response. So is there some point at which it peaks out like caffeine does and goes down? All of this basically means that you need a large body of studies of you know, various different structures and amounts and ways of looking at it. And it needs to be replicated across different universities and different study groups and different laboratories. And there needs to be an interest in that, not only scientific interest in that, maybe even a money interest in that, because of course, all of this costs money. Regardless of whether or not pure science is funded by the university or is funded by the government or funded by private, you know, it's, it still takes attention, which takes money, which takes manpower and these kind of things. So there just hasn't been a large enough robust base of other chemicals outside of caffeine to say conclusively, this is exactly what I can recommend for this dosage or this amount. So what I would recommend are things like the Joe Rogan podcast or on it, the website that does nootrop nootropics or runtime.gg, which is a site which is not up yet, which is going to be up soon where we will be recommending and exploring the anecdotal evidence of all of these chemicals and, and basically going through the studies and, and showing them, like bringing them open and cracking them open and letting you guys make your own discoveries and test your own assumptions and figure out what works for your body. Because that's really kind of the only way forward in that kind of frontier. So unfortunately, I don't have an answer for you right now, but I will say keep in tune over the next two weeks for a podcast or a show, video show that I'm starting with this gentleman, wonderful gentleman, and we're going to be exactly exploring this concept of what it is that you can do to optimize yourself in order to push through in esports and in life in terms of uh, micronutrients and food. Okay, the next question is from Resist Impulse, and they say selective toxicity investigations question kind of question mark, a healthy method for policing the pro player base. So in other words, if we do randomized toxicity checking, just like we do randomized drug testing, is that a good way to keep players and pros in, in check? I think that it's a good way to keep pros in check. I think it's a horrible way to keep players in check because the consequence of you getting discovered as a toxic player are not grave. This, the discovery of you getting doping in sport means your career is over. That means everything that you sacrificed the last 10 years of your life for is done. 10, 20, 30, 40, maybe your whole life. It's over. Okay, so the consequences of doping are strong enough that the threat of a randomized test can ensure compliance in many different sports. And then it's just like a, a competition of who can keep up, the, the testers or the people who are administering all of the illegal uh, performance enhancing drugs. So it's an arms race. But if we go into toxicity checking on, the, on an anonymous player base who will get at worst a chat restriction or an account ban whereupon they can start another account, and at most you lose, you know, months of kind of grinding in terms of your account level. So we're talking about months here, not decades. No, I don't think the impact is psychologically like dangerous enough for people to give that up. I mean, here you have people who are risking their 20, 30 year careers just for that. So of course, somebody's gonna easily risk their account to be toxic in the heat of the moment. As far as pros go, I think that we don't need to do randomized selection. Like there's so much scrutiny on pros that it will be reported no matter what in a crowdsourced way. The reason that we do randomized testing for, for drugs in the sport world is because there's nobody watching these people. But if we don't need to do randomized toxicity testing on pros because they're being watched all the time by everybody. There has never been a sport in human history that is as scrutinized as eSport is and in particular, League of Legends professionals. You can count on the fact that if they do one single thing wrong ever, it's gonna come out and be plastered all over the internet 
and uh, you know impact their career and it's a really high stress kind of way to live so yeah I don't think that randomized testing would have any difference on on how they behave okay the fourth question from Askichi Kun so this is a repeat questioner and they ask do you think Riot would one day make team make teams draft rookies from college teams like in traditional sports does the publisher of a game force teams to draft rookies from college teams? I, I don't think that's how it works. I think there's a draft and you can go into it like at any age. You can drop out of college and do it. Teams do it because it's a really good farm system, like you, you can prove yourself in college. And so I don't think people force teams to do that. I think it's how the system works out. Correct me if I'm wrong though, obviously, I, I'm not really sure. but. No, I don't, I don't think Riot's going to force teams to draft rookies from college teams. That doesn't make sense. The reason that they do it is because those, that's where the best athletes are. Teams are just going to draft from where the best athletes are. If the best athletes start coming from college programs, then they will. But I think right now in eSport, if you're in college and you have a chance to get drafted by a team, you should not finish college. You should go immediately and play. If you get drafted and picked up by a pro team, first of all, they don't have to wait till you finish college. And secondly, neither should you. Just go. Go and do it. You can go back to university. You can't go back to this opportunity of being one of the most rare commodities in the world, which is an eSport athlete in 2016, 2017. Okay, next question is from serpent underscore OG. And they ask, I'm 16 and want to go pro. I'm at Diamond 1. What should I do from here? Get to Masters and Challenger. Keep plugging, keep going at it. If you're 16 years old, you have you know, a year, two years, three years, four years to, I want to say like cost-free involvement, investment in your perfection of your game. So you should be trying to get highest rank as possible on the ladder while being productive in all areas of your life. So the more that you're able to stay high ranked and get high ranked while still doing other things. So think for example, Biofrost and TSM, who's able to effectively do school, be social, have friends and maintain you know, a really, really high rank on the ladder. That is that is kind of like, then he came in with, with a vast skill set, a skill set of not just being a, a one dimensional person, but being a person who could balance, you know, different responsibilities, who was developing as a person, who was picking up these social skills, picking up these academic skills, was able to focus on one thing and then change trajectory, focus on something else. Eminently coachable is going to have, you know, a stellar career because he's able to come out as a rookie and and kind of have the drive and the ability to step on stage and do get that, those kind of things, mostly because of the way that he, you know, tackled everything in life in a very serious way before he became a pro. I think he did two years of university. So before he dropped out and went to, went to a pro, TSM, just like I was talking about before. So what I recommend is that you focus on keeping your life not, it doesn't have to be super diverse. You don't have to do like 50 million activities, but, I, but don't cut things out for league right now. Instead, get better at focusing on league when you're doing league and improvement and try to continue doing other things. Get more efficient, effective at your league training instead of lengthening your league training. That will prove far more useful in, first of all, breaking through plateaus and getting to a higher rank, but secondly, in the kind of skills that you need as a pro. The number one skill of professional League of Legends players is the ability to learn the number one skill. It doesn't matter if you're good on a patch if you can't be good on the next patch. And you have to be the first person in the world who's the best on the next patch or you lose. That's the first thing I tell every single team that I go into. I say, what is the number one skill of a League of Legends player? And they say, mm, unless they've had me before. They come up with a bunch of random stuff, in which case they don't really know. But the answer is the ability to learn. It doesn't matter if you're the best person in the world on a patch if it changes and two weeks later you are bad again. You have to be able to become the best on like f four champions or three champions on a patch f as fast as humanly possible, faster than anybody else. And then you can keep ahead of that curve. You can keep getting higher and faster and faster. You know, you can keep getting better and better and better, faster than the next person because you're already ahead of them. So then you can be working on teamwork before they work on teamwork. Then you can work on optimization. Then you can work on the next strategy. And the game is always refining, so you're always learning. Get really effective at your ability to learn study every patch, make predictions, test the predictions, see if you were right, you, you know, move forward in that way and, and really hone in the skills and stay diversified so that you have this pressure, this pressure on your life to do all of this in less time. 
to become you know better in less time so the pressure forces you like a winnowing fire to refine your skill set okay the next question is from get the lantern get to the lantern get to the lantern or thresh will take your soul and he asks or she asks hey what could i what i could do okay that's backwards dude what could i do to have it Impact, high impact on games as an AD carry since it's one of the weakest roles right now. I'm not sure that that's true. Sorry. But as an AD carry, just to have an higher impact on games, you should do the same thing that you do in many other roles, which is you should focus on, first of all, optimizing your role. So you need to be able to show up to every single fight and also make sure that you catch farm on time which means you need to have two skill sets. You need to have the skill set of knowing exactly when the wave is going to crash so that you can not be there, so you can be somewhere else. And you have to know, you have to be pay attention to how your teams are moving the waves and where your team is moving so that you can be there when the wave crashes, when it hits the turret, so you can hit the turret three times before the wave gets cleared by their wave clear and then you back out. You need to have your timing on map movement. You, if you're not there, it's over. If you're an AD carry and, and you're four steps behind and the fight's over when you get there, that was your fault. Okay, you, you, you couldn't rein your team in enough and, and they couldn't wait for you, but mostly it's just that you needed to be there. You should be able to predict the future on where you need to be. And when you catch and you clear, you want to know how to prep the wave so that it can automatically push out and reflect. And then you want to go apply, apply pressure somewhere else and then catch the reflecting wave. I think you can see a real big difference in the mid game between AD carries and, and essentially like how they catch and manipulate side waves in solo queue. It's just incredibly natural, you know, and unforced and optimal in terms of farm. And the worst ones just kind of like go around and soak up farm everywhere and, and steal it from everybody instead of managing to optimize their own farm while letting their teammates farm. And if their teammates are farming badly, you know, so be it. But you can, you can tell the skill set difference between somebody who just goes and steals their teammates' farm and somebody who is optimizing their opportunities on the map and preventing their opponents from, from getting the same kind of you know, farm advantage. And then I would say the second thing you should focus on is laning phase. I mean, laning phase is, is just crucial. And then positioning in team fights. So I think that a lot of this relies a lot on the support and jungle, usually. So it's really hard to to kind of say, okay, I want to be a best, the best, I want to be the best team fight AD carry ever, um, and, and train that in solo queue. It's probably not going to happen, but I would, I would definitely prep for fights using imagery. Imagine what's going to happen. Imagine how the perfect fight would look like, and then try to execute on that. Try to see skills as they're happening. Try to dodge. Put yourself out in front of the minion wave as it's advancing. Dodge skill shots. Just practice your predictive ability. Predict where a skill shot's going to be when somebody's going to try to hit you, and then put yourself in a position to be hit by that and then dodge it when they when they when you predict that they're gonna throw it out and uh, sometimes they'll get caught and that'll end the team fight before it ever started but you'll get way better at dodging and you'll have this very aggressive play style that wins a lot of games but be able to turn that off okay make it like a nozzle you know you're doing that for a specific purpose to get better but it doesn't have to be the dominant way that you play when you want to win a game so you have to know then what it looks like when you don't do that you know when you're just positioned well all the time and, and when you're trying to minimize the opportunity that you'll get hit with a skill shot at all, not that you will dodge it. Okay, those are my suggestions. All right, that's the show for today. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to check out, in relation to the first question that I was talking about, you know, mental focus, my mindfulness acceptance commitment program, the MAC program. So it's essentially just training focus. That's what it's for. Whether you want focus to be a student or an esport athlete or a business manager, whatever. Acceptance, commitment, and awareness, mindfulness, those are the essential tools into being able to become more effective at kind of all in on what you're doing. Okay, but more importantly, if you're not ready for that today, make sure to sign up for my list, which is also linked down below, Weldon's List, and you will get all the best ofs from my website, mindgames.gg, where I have been blogging since 2012, and also a couple of videos that I produced for a free course called Foundations Training in 2000. 14, I believe, yeah, 2014, which are called, you know, Foundations 1, 2, 3. They have really cool names. I don't really remember them off the top of my head, but the first one is about motivation. The second one is about support network, or the third one's about support network. The second one, yeah, the second one's about goal setting and designing goals. Check those out. They will come in the Weldon's list when you see them. And then finally, the five-minute journal, which I link down below for your convenience. It's a tool, the most effective tool for the time you will spend 
I have found that to be the number one thing to make a difference in the shortest amount of time expended and effort expended on my part in terms of how practical it enriches your time, how practically it enriches my time and what I get done. Have a good night, everybody. If you're watching this in the morning, I apologize for wishing you a good night, but I've been waiting all day to make this video. I'm super excited about it. Even though I don't seem excited, I've been thinking about getting to sit down and finally turn out another show here in Finland. I don't have an office yet because we're moving soon. So I'm just kind of like in this empty room in my house, which used to have a bed in it and now just has a bunch of boxes and one of my new filming lights up here so that you can see my nice well-lit face kind of unless I pull my hat down because I don't have it positioned well and the other one is in the kids room because we don't have a lamp in there right now. So anyway, that's the state that I'm in right now. And let me see what time it is. Say hello to Snapchat, everybody. Hi. Oh, by the way, follow me on Snapchat. I'm checking my time by taking a snap and then going to the time filter. What in the heck? Okay, yeah. 12.31, baby. I need to get some sleep. Signing out.